Hey, hey, everybody. We're live. Come on in. Come on into the fold. Right. Uh, so this is very exciting. I have taken a little break from Facebook Live because I really wanted to refocus my interviews on being a vegan. And Vegan Nation is the new interview series that I have still as a part of my celebrity dinner party with Elizabeth Alfano. So today's first guest on the Vegan Nation specific interview series is Ethan Brown. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor to be here. And it is a thrill to have you here. In case you don't know, Ethan Brown, he is the CEO, founder, creator, fabulous innovator of Beyond Meat. Thank you. So uh, first, tell us, what is Beyond Meat? And I'm going to say, someone give me Beyond Meat so I can reach it. Oh, good. I'm there eating. You go. People, so you know are, that's what are I do. Our, I'm eating our, here. These are new sausages. And uh, I love this product. It's, I think we have the hot Italian and the brat here for you. Oh. Um, and we also have some burgers. Um, but the, the basic principle behind Beyond Meat is that you don't need an animal to produce a piece of meat. Yes. And this is something that we've been working on for almost a decade. And the idea is that if you look at the core parts of meat, whether you look at the amino acids or the lipids or trace minerals or water, meat is predominantly water, it's about 65% water. Uh, none of those are exclusive to the animal. They're all present outside of the animal in actual abundance, right? So you can get all kinds of protein from plants. You can get fat from plants. You can get water from many places. So we're taking all of those resources and we're putting them into the architecture of meat. And we do that by basically running the material through heating, cooling, and pressure. That realigns it into the fibrous texture of muscle or meat. And that's how we build meat from plants. And so the efficiency of that is enormous. And once you think about replicating that out across the economy, you can mm -hmm. see the benefits that can have from all kinds of things, whether it's climate change, you know, human health, uh, natural resources, animal welfare, et cetera. Right. So for those of you who've maybe already tried Beyond Meat, and I'm going to do this right now, I've had the burgers, but I've never had the sausage. You're not just trying to be efficient with your resources, you're also literally trying to replicate the taste yeah. and texture of meat. Yes, I mean, we, we believe that if we can be that group of people that separates meat from animals, we can make a massive contribution to mm. not only our own species, but the rest of the species we share the earth with. What do you think about it? This tastes so much like sausage. <laughs> it's good, and you're coming from Chicago, so I appreciate mm. that. <laughs> sausage town. Yeah. Oh my God. I'll have to try one. Mm. Try one. Mm. Make sure this is a... Uh, it's, it's for real. Oh my gosh, it tastes so much like meat. Mm, that's good. Yeah, that's a good one. And they're, I don't know if you can see this, they're really thick and big. Mm. Oh my gosh. So I have a quick question for you before I bring in a southern man who eats meat. Because <laughs> he's never tasted Beyond Meat and I want to see like what he thinks of it himself. What is more important for you when you tell people this is not from animals, or right. this is efficient for the planet, or this is good for you. One of the things that excited me about Beyond Meat was I'd never seen in my professional career the opportunity to simultaneously attack uh, really four issues that, that I care deeply about. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you look at, at, at human health and the relationship between you know animal protein and, and whether it's heart disease, diabetes, or cancer. You know, then you look at uh, climate change, and you know overwhelmingly, uh, you know uh, livestock is the largest contributor yes. to the greenhouse gas emissions. Right. And then you look at natural resources, whether it's water or fuel or land. You know, Eighty percent of our arable land is now used to, to, to raise food for, for livestock, either through grazing or through through crops. And then animal welfare is another issue I care a lot about. So all four of those things, just by simply changing the protein at the center of the plate, not telling people not to eat meat, not telling people they have to start eating X, Y, and Z, but rather providing them meat, but meat that's made from plants, you can positively impact all four of those things. So that's what I get motivated about every day when I come in. Now in our office, in our labs, and in our, our factory, we have people coming from all different walks of life, and some tend to think about human health. Maybe they have an aunt or an uncle or a parent who suffered from some particular disease that could be avoided, um, or you have people who are animal rights advocates. So we welcome everybody. Mm -hmm. And try to create an environment where everyone feels comfortable. You know, not everyone who works at our company is is, is vegetarian or vegan. We have oh. many carnivores, but uh, but you know, there are people who are saying, "Look, we want to reduce the amount of animal protein we're having right. while we still continue to enjoy meat, but plant based meat." Right. And personally, I'm vegan, but even if people cut meat down fifty percent, that would be an enormous yeah. impact on the environment and their own health and their own wallet. Because in the yep. end, your health issues are your financial issues. In the end. Yep. But uh, speaking about meat eaters. I'm going to take a slight back seat here, and I'm going to bring over... Well, now we have sausages for you, too. I'm bringing over a meat eater from the South. We're putting it to the test. So uh, I'm going to switch places here with David. He's jumping in on the conversation. So, David, uh, 
Tell us where you're from, first of all. So I'm originally from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Hey, I went to school. That's where my grandpa's from. Really? Oh, yeah. He used to go to Lookout Mountain. He went to Yeah. Macaulay. Well, I worked on, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. worked on Lookout Mountain at uh, yeah. Rock City. Yeah. 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 So he was born in uh, 1901. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So wow. I didn't know him, but. Yeah. <laughs> no. Close, but no. Yeah, so close. Yeah. Just yeah. missed it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, all right, Mr. Meat Eater. So we have a sausage, which isn't even on the market yet. So lucky, lucky you. Yeah. And then we have a hamburger, which I didn't even uh, bite into yet. So go right ahead and tell hey, me go what you think. First. Oh, yeah. Okay. Go for right. the burger. Just both look really good, but I'm just, I'm feeling the burger at the moment. Oh, yeah. All right. Mm. That's really good. Oh, thank you. That's really good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. Try the sausage. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So I'm curious because it's been so long since I've eaten meat. So that's the hot Italian. Okay, so we got some jalapenos yeah, so on what's there the too. Difference between them again? A uh, hot Italian bratwurst. Gotcha. I want to try the hot Italian. Mm. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, that's you. what. Yeah, that's good, right? I'm I'm big on the spicier yeah. stuff, so. Yeah, no, it's nice. What's cool about these is too, once you start to get the basic platform done for creating that fibrous texture of meat through through plants. You can start to use other sources of protein. So this has mm -hmm. different proteins in it. It has oh. they both share in common uh, pea protein, but this also has fava bean protein and some other things um, that we rice protein mm -hmm. that I want to start introducing in greater volume into our products. So the consumer, you know, my hope is that someday the consumer will be able to go to the meat case and they'll be able to one day have a sausage made from all lentil protein, the next yeah. day from camelina protein, the next day oh, from more. lupin protein, <laughs> etc. So their body's getting all these diverse proteins uh, from different plant feedstocks. So it's it's possible to use different proteins Absolutely. beyond pea. I wasn't yeah. sure if it was something particular that pea that lent itself to making yeah. the burger. There's nothing special about peas. What, what's special about pea protein today is that it's been scaled up. And okay. if you look at the history of um, you know, the, the commodity market and, and, and particularly protein isolates, most of them were developed uh, as concentrates for animal feed, right? And then they took the next step for, to, for human consumption. But that's why you see so much soy protein that's why you see so much um, um, uh, other forms of contrary protein. But in the case of um, uh, pea protein, it was largely scheduled for starch. People were using peas for starch, That's what right? I thought, yeah. And so this derivative stream of protein coming out of peas is so, well, hey, let's monetize this. So they created businesses around that. But if you start from you know first principles first and you say, okay, we're gonna start using these fields and these plants for protein for direct human consumption through animal uh, through plant-based meat, then you say, okay. Well, what are the most efficient ways to grow that? And you start looking at the crops that are most efficient. And it's amazing how many there are that have really interesting sources of protein. The legume family is really rich in proteins, but there's also mm. strange ones, like you got cottonseed as protein. You know, tobacco oh, leaves. Interesting. I wouldn't suggest you use it, but tobacco, yeah. <laughs> tobacco leaf has protein in it, right? So, so once, really once, yeah, once you start to say, okay, well, I'm not going to dedicate these fields to feeding animals. I'm going to dedicate them to growing protein for human consumption. Mm -hmm. It opens up a real world of innovation for the farmer. And that's yeah. one thing I'm super excited about focusing on in this next phase of Beyond Meat. I'm, bu I'm bumping you out so we can get yeah, him back in for frame. Sure. Um, that is fascinating to me. So wait, what's your vote here? Oh, those are fantastic. I'm, again, I'm a more on the the spicier stuff is is my thing. Okay. So I'm down for that. But both of those are really good. Okay. Would you know that it's not me? Honestly, probably not. And what surprised me, especially the sausage, like yeah. both of them, I yeah. think probably so. But the sausage, really, like I would, I would think that that was sausage. Great. Thank you. Legitimately. Thank you. Thank you. So, Score. Yeah, those are both great. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I think a, Come on in. A mantra for, with us for the for the company really is around as good as these are and as much as we love them, um, you know, we're continually working on improving them, right? And so, you know, we want to get to the point where we're completely naked outside of any you know, build or anything else around it, this is completely indistinguishable from animal protein. So who is your market? Is it vegans who right. just kind of miss this from time to time? Or is it really the diehard Southerners right. who like their meat right. and you're converting them? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's, it's for sure, you know, I have a lot of respect for the role that meat has played in our culture and, and in literally in our evolution in terms of shaping who we are as humans. I don't think that there's going to be a day when we're not consuming meat, but I'm absolutely convinced that there's going to be a day when we're consuming plant-based meat. And so I want this to be attractive to the hardcore carnivores, uh, through to vegans alike, but we really go after the carnivore in our marketing. Oh, you do? Yeah, you really go yeah. after the carnivore? We appreciate very much the vegan vegetarian support. You know, I'm vegan, and, and so I, that's really my, my home, but... but we need to appeal to to the mainstream carnivore, and that's really what we go after. So that's fascinating to me that you're really going after the carnivore, and have they gone for it? Yeah, I mean, I think we see, you know, we, we have a lot of anecdotal information around that, but we see, for example, when we went into the meat case um, two years ago now, 
uh, at Whole Foods first, and now we're in places like Ralph's and, and you know, um, Bacon and Kroger, et cetera. But, you know, when we first uh, did that, we did some exit interviews of people coming out, having mm-hmm. purchased it, and we found that about 70% of consumers uh, that were buying the, the burger in the meat case were uh, self-identifying as carnivores. So <sighs> we think it's a flexitarian population, largely, yes. um, you know, people who are integrating uh, one or more plant-based uh, protein into their diet on a weekly basis. I think we're capturing that population pretty well, but we want to continue to expand it. And is that population strictly millennials? I find them no. to be very mm-hmm. open to yeah. um, not doing anything to harm the yeah. planet and yeah. also trying to be healthy and yeah. just I mean, being very I, I honestly around. say this a lot. I say thank God for millennials because they are, they are thinking very yes. differently. Right. Uh, transparency is huge to them. Value-based yes. companies are really big. And, and you know, I think they, they uh, vote with their wallet on these things. And so they're absolutely coming in droves to our product. And I think every time we make our product slightly better, we welcome more and more people into it mm-hmm. because there's a latent desire for this to work. I think most people want this solution to work. Right? There are very few people like, no, I, I want to keep slaughtering animals. I don't think that's... I don't think that's the norm. The norm is people would love to have an alternative that's just as good, right? And so we get a lot of that population, but we also get a lot of population over 40 who, let's say they go to the doctor and say, you know, right. blood pressure issue, or they say you heart, know, disease, heart disease in mm-hmm. your family or Diabetes. whatever. And so that cuts across. And that was one of the first observations I had when we were forming the company was I had to demo a lot of this stuff, at, let's say like at Whole Foods. And mm-hmm. we were on the East Coast at that time. So I'd go into Ohio, Kentucky, Pennsylvania mm-hmm. and do demos. Women in particular come up and say, you know, I can get my husband to eat this, and he needs to because of X, Y, and Z. And so I said, okay, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. People will want a solution here. They want to keep consuming meat, but they have problems with what's doing to their body, right? So let's create something that's better. So this is very inspirational to me because I was afraid you might say, yes, people know that it's bad for them, which mm-hmm. is obviously a physical problem. And then I, as I say, it's also a wallet problem. Mm-hmm. And they know that they shouldn't. But really, culturally, they feel, and this is a movie, The Game Changers, you guys have heard me talk about that movie, they really address the cultural sense that a lot of people are tied to meat, even though there's so many reasons not to meat. Yeah. So I wondered how much you butt up against just, I'm a man, I eat meat. Yeah, no, you get that a lot. And one of the things that we do and we've done for years now is use athletes to to yes. promote the, the, the um, benefits of our product. So one of the early athletes signed was a guy named J.J. Reddick, who plays in Philadelphia. You know, he's made $23 million this year shooting a basketball. So you know, he's a high-performing athlete, mm-hmm. right? Um, what he eats is very important to him. And one of the reasons he relies on our products is that they're, you know, they create that um, energy burst for him. There's The inflammation issue isn't there where, where it is with, with animal protein. He doesn't feel as full, et cetera. But you look at other people on our, our list. We have um, you know, Tia Blanco, who's a terrific um, female surfer. We have a whole group of athletes that are out there promoting the fact that they're performing better on plant-based protein, right? And so... Um, I think that myth is one that is many, many, many centuries old. You know, this, in, in, in the sort of time of Charles Dickens, one of the theories about why uh, the lower class in, in England was uh, so impoverished was that they didn't have access to meat, therefore they couldn't function as well, right? And so yeah. this is a big bias we have to yes. get over. And, you know, on the one hand, you know, meat is a very nutrient-dense source of food, Right. Maybe at that time, we didn't have technology to build it from plants. There, there may have been something to the fact that that was maybe a preferred source of protein. But today, we have the ability to build it. So let's do it. Let's go ahead and build it. So I, we won't need it. I couldn't agree yeah. more. And many things have happened. First of all, none of us want to live in the time of Charles Dickens. So right. we've all progressed. Yeah. Also, the quality of meat seems to me, and I'm, there may be other perspectives, and I'd love to hear from you on Facebook Live, so so tell me, um, since the time of Charles Dickens, we stuff them with antibiotics, we're sticking them with all these drugs, the conditions for the animals have gotten worse, smaller, yeah. tighter, the demand on produce, produce yeah. has made so much more stress in the animals, and ultimately, the people who eat that meat, they're the ones getting that stress, Correct. right we, from we, their <clears throat> muscles into your muscles. And we've lost a really important characteristic of meat, which is scarcity. You know, Meat, right. meat yes. as a traditional in the role of the uh, human diet it was scarce, right? right? And it so, was a rarity. You had yeah. it maybe once a week. Yeah, and so when you turn this into something that's now every day and ubiquitous and maybe even three times a day, it has a profoundly different impact on the body. That's right, on the body yeah. and on the planet. Yeah. I think uh, the statistic is there are 7 billion people on the planet and yeah. we kill 70 billion animals Yeah, yeah the proportions, the proportions right? are staggering. Are staggering. Yeah. And the amount of waste from the animal itself, because it's really not an efficient use of right. protein resources, etc., but then how much we waste of the animal. Yeah. And when you're talking about bacon and donuts and whiskey and, you know, not to mention lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, yeah. supersized, yeah. you got to think like, okay, when is... 
when this, is, is it going to stop? Yeah. Well, when is it going to stop and when is it going to explode? Yeah. I mean, so at what point do you say, oh, but culturally I'm aligned to meat, therefore I'll take the heart attack. Like, when do you say like, oh, right. wait a minute, that's actually isn't so smart for me. Yeah. Well, there's an enormous, uh, I think about this all the time because of the business that I'm in, but there's, you know, there's all these, if you think about switching from, let's say, a landline to a mobile phone, hmm. there's very little emotional issue with that right, right. I mean, people don't defend the landline you know <laughs> they don't no but but right. you know in the case of meat it becomes very personal very quickly when you talk to someone you say look i have a better source of meat for you it's this sausage it tastes great you know it doesn't give you any sorts of you know nitrates or anything like that still it's like there's something emotional about giving up the sausage that i had and i think if you look at you know, whether it's religion you know mm. where there's an enormous connection to animals and you know religious holidays and the mm. genesis and, and all these things mm. you look at you know culture with you know thanksgiving and yes. you know the holidays and the easter lamb and all that mm. so we have a lot to sort of unwind about mm-hmm. how we think about ourselves relative to other species on the planet and i hope that it can start with providing people with an alternative where it's not hard mm-hmm. where it's just right. absolutely easy to do yes yeah. right yeah. Uh, and and that's one of the things that i love is that you call it meat you yeah, still you call it to. meat you have to yeah. so yeah. It's yeah. it's plant based meat, but it's yeah. still meat, and yeah. you call it because technically it is. Is that yeah, what you're I mean, saying, or the, you call it because it tastes like meat? No, no. We, I really feel strongly about this. So the Cattlemen Association is a, a sort of petition saying that they'd rather that we we didn't use the word meat. In fact, are asking the government to stop the Cattlemen's you? Association. Yeah. The Cattlemen's Not us, Association, but the, but the government. All right. And so you know, I take issue with that because I feel that you know, if you if you are insisting that meat come from, let's say, a chicken, cow, or pig. You know, you're really constrained in terms of the number of solutions you can 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 provide and, and and what kind of impact you have on the world. If you shift your thinking just slightly and think about meat in terms of composition, those four things I talked about with its amino acids, lipids, trace minerals, or water. If we deliver all of those things and we deliver them the same architecture as animal protein or meat, right? We literally follow the blueprint, put them together in the same way. It's the same experience for the consumer. They have all the same benefits. I'd be hard pressed not to call that meat. Mm-hmm. And what have they said to this? Because I'm curious about the backlash, if there is any. Yeah, I mean, there's just concern. I mean, th- their argument, which I, I don't think is sound, is that it's confusing the consumer. And I'm pretty certain the consumer can understand what plant based meat is. We have faith in the consumer. Yeah. Yes, and they are guiding you. The consumer, absolutely. We listen day in and day out to the consumer. Our um, uh, MO at the company is to release new products every year, get the feedback from the consumers. So you'll see things that are reflective of consumer behavior in this. So, for example, there's no soy, there's no wheat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's literally from listening to the consumer, right? And so we say, we're going to keep those out of our product, right? No soy, no wheat. Yeah. I was going to ask you why there was no soy. Yeah, it's, it, there's, I mean, we've never had wheat because my dad has celiac, and I've always wanted him to be able to enjoy the products. But, but we've also stayed true to that because the consumer has said, you know, we're overwhelmed with the amount of wheat we're consuming in our diet. We feel there's too much soy in our diet, et cetera. You know, and whether valid or not, the consumer is speaking, and we have to listen. I love that. I love that. And you know who else is speaking that I wouldn't have thought is that one of your investors is Tyson. Yeah. So if you doubt for some reason, if you're a meat eater and you're thinking like, oh, well, these, these two people are non-meat eaters, so they're kind of always going to be biased for it. Tyson, big investor. Yeah. Why is that? So you know, we began talking in 2012. Mm. We're not, yeah. Um, and it was when, when uh, we started our conversation with Hillshire, which was then acquired by, by Tyson. And, and there's some really forward-thinking executives both in, in Hillshire and also in Tyson that you know, see this as a common mission to serve the, the world uh, sustainably with protein, right? And it's remarkable how open uh, they can be around the concept of, of where that protein comes from. Mm-hmm. And so if you look at you know, China and its escalating meat consumption, yeah. you, know, you look at what could potentially happen in India and Africa, et cetera, <laughs> as, as affluence um, gains there. Um, we need to have a different solution. I think they're aware of that. And so, you know, we have we have the Humane Society's investor and we have Tyson investor. And I think that's the appropriate way to approach this because it's not a us versus them. We don't have time for that, right? This is a how do we work together to try to bring a solution to market that people are going to clamor for? Not that they're going to feel obligated. We're not telling them to, you know, put on a sweater or ride a bus to deal with, you know, uh, energy issues. What we're telling them is that we're creating something that's better, just in the same vein as Tesla saying, I'm creating a really sexy car you're going to want. We're trying to create products here that people really desire right, mm-hmm. and don't feel obligated to have. Yeah. So I have to say hats off to Tyson because they are smart enough to say, I want to get on the future of food bandwagon. No matter what, that we're not interested in like splitting hairs. If it's right. plant-based meat, we'll do it because that's where the money is and that's where the future is. I'm yep. guessing, I should ask you, where is the future of food? Going? Yeah, no, I feel very much that it's, you know, I, I don't think that we're going to go to um, a, a diet where we're consuming, you know, just 
you know, plants and vegetables in their native form. I think as mm-hmm. desirable as that would be, and I think that hopefully there'll be more of that. I think we are acclimated to meat as a as a source of protein. I think that we can absolutely shift that meat consumption from animal based meat to plant based meat. And I think that will happen. I think it's almost inevitable. Mm-hmm. And you know what has always shocked me even before I got into the field was, you know, I came out of the alternative energy sector where the company I was with, great company, uh, Proton Exchange Membrane Fuel Cell Company. I spent a billion dollars developing fuel cells, had investment mm. in public markets, et cetera, uh, from Ford and the like. And, you know, that's an important solution is creating, you know, emission-free vehicles, for example. But what if you create a more sustainable source of meat for the center of the plate? How big would that be? So why not spend a billion? Why not spend $10 million doing that? If the planet's health lays in the balance, why not do that? Yes, and because as most of you all know, much more of the emission gases come from factory farms than ever come yeah. from airplanes, buses, taxis, yeah. Ubers altogether. Yeah, so. it's not well understood by by consumers, but that is a, that is one of the key motivations for, for why we started the company. You know, it's another reason why I like this discussion so much because the plant-based meat perspective is to really educate people. And yes. I feel that the meat and dairy industry intentionally mm-hmm. miseducates or undereducates people yeah. because I don't think people really realize what the runoff is in their own water that they end up drinking, what the effect is on their own air from all the emissions, obviously the animal cruelty, which is egregious and quite covered up. And then, you know, they have their own sort of issue with their own health. So I think on a lot of platforms, um, meat and dairy aren't that uh, forthcoming because I think the protein myth is that you don't need as much protein as... Correct. You know, we, we do consume too much protein. But on that question of transparency, uh, mm. Biz Stone and Eva Williams from, from Twitter, some of our investors, and years ago, uh, I can remember Biz talking about wanting to put uh, you know, cameras throughout our facility so that people could see at any time right. how their food is being made. Yeah. And I love that idea. Yeah, me uh, too. And, and, you know, we would ask, can others do that? And obviously they can't, right? And so... We they, really feel open and don't have anything to hide. They can. They won't. They won't, right. They won't, <laughs> right. still have customers. Right? Yeah, yes, right, right. Uh, you're talking about the meat and dairy industry. Okay, well, I just want to make sure that I get to a couple questions. Yeah, we do have one question from Diana who asked for Ethan. What was the biggest challenge for you? Uh, what did you face when creating this idea and starting this company? What was the biggest challenge? Did you find any challenges um, with there being people you worked with to get this company started since it was meat <clears> years? Right. I mean, I think I think the the challenges were somewhat routine in, in starting a, a new business. I mean, tr- trying to you know, there's a, there's a there's a great saying that entrepreneurs uh, tell the truth in advance, <laughs> and and you have to believe so you have to believe so strongly in what you're doing, and others will sort of doubt it, mm-hmm. right? But you have to have arrived at that point, and so you know, I there was other products in the market, but I my idea and, and the, the motivation of the company was to really actually try to build a piece of meat directly from plants, not to mimic meat, not mm-hmm. to make a soybean behave in some way or, you know, put enough sauce on it, but to, to literally understand the fundamental structure of meat and then rebuild it. And that's kind of a, at the time was a strange idea Mm -hmm. and, and one that required people to sort of buy in. Right. And, and, you know, when you, I spent my own money first and, and, you know, then ran out of it. Right. And so you run into those kind of obstacles, but thank God we got some really important people to believe in this. And, And it really, you know, started not only with the friends and family, but uh, Kleiner Perkins invested very early, a guy named Ray Lane and Amol Desponde, and, and Ray is with me today, and he's probably my most significant business mentor. Uh, but you know, he said, yeah, I believe in what you're going to do, we're going to fund it, and he's stuck with me through the thick and thin. And since then, we've added an amazing board, but, but uh, surrounding yourself with people that share your vision is probably one of the most important things you can do. Because you can, if you have that, you can go get the resources. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, Bill Gates jumped on board he pretty did. quickly, yeah. didn't yeah, he? he did. He did. And what was the reasoning for him? So I think you know, sustainability for sure, mm-hmm. and his advice, right. which I think about uh, a lot, was to you know um, go international as quick as you can, which mm. we're doing. Uh, we're you in, are. Yeah, we're in Hong Kong. We're going to be in Europe. Um, so we, we are trying to get into the markets where where, the, where there's a real need. Great. Um, and so and then second was to drop the price uh, below that of meat uh, as quick as you can, oh. and that's something we are I love over him. the long <laughs> it's great. over the long run going to achieve. Mm-hmm. You know, as as the supply chain matures, we'll achieve that. That's wonderful. Well, uh, another question. Yeah, we oh, more we questions. got more questions. Okay, yes. We do. Uh, from James asked, "What do you think the future of insect protein is in oh. the North American market?" Well, that's an interesting right. question. Yeah, so I've looked at a bunch of different approaches, whether it's insect protein or lab-grown uh, meat or, or our own approach, and and um, I think they all have a place. Um, 
<clears throat> there's, you know, as I talked about my board a little bit, Don Thompson, uh, who's the former CEO of McDonald's, is an investor and a board member and just led our last round and also become a, a close friend. And his wife, Liz, and, and, and I were all talking um, several years ago about the innovation we have in our company. And, and you know, we, we really invest in innovation. We have the, some of the best scientists from around the world working on this. Um, but one thing we, we restrict them is say you can't use GMOs, right? And you have to try to use ingredients that people can identify with. So the red in our burger, for example, is beet juice, right? And the reason we do that is we want mom to be comfortable feeding her family our products, her kids. And no mom wants to be the first to experiment with a novel ingredient, right? right? And so we needed to really adhere to that. And so while I was describing all these things, you know, uh, Liz Thompson stopped me and said, you know, innovation is good for my iPhone, but I don't want to put it in my mouth. And that mm. really made an impression on me, right? Yeah. So we're using the highest science. We're using some of the most sophisticated um, technologies come out of the medical community, for example, on imaging and things like that. But at the end of the day, we have to produce something that people are comfortable with. And I'm not sure that, the, at least the North American consumer, is going to be comfortable with, 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 with cricket protein. I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Even though cricket mm-hmm. protein would be natural. It would be natural, but is there a sort of cultural issue mm-hmm. that you have to get around? To eating bugs. But I'm certainly not, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I'm very focused on my solution, I think. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yes. Um, well, so I would love a couple of tips for anybody trying to go vegan or if you're maybe already planning based, but you're trying to go vegan beyond food. Any yeah. lifestyle tips and any diet tips? Sure. No, uh, on, on, <clears throat> on lifestyle uh, beyond food um, for being uh, male, one of the things you can get an increasing number of, you know, um, basically non-animal leather shoes, yeah. belts, etc. It's yeah. great to support that industry um, and not the not the leather industry. So agree. Um, and, you know, just on a general lifestyle thing about how we approach our business, um, I definitely come to the office uh, eating to be successful that day, right? Like I always, I very focus on my diet and will my diet sustain me, you know, oh. throughout the day mm-hmm. and high, high levels of focus, et cetera. And you can see marked differences in your productivity based on the food you eat, right? So, you know, if you have a very carb heavy breakfast, for example, you just don't perform as well, right? But you know, I would often, for many years, I just had our chicken strips for breakfast, right? Because I really wanted that core protein and, and that feeling of, 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 of kind of alertness that you get when you have a, a, a higher level of protein in the morning. Um, so I, I, when people are interviewing with me, I always say, you know, approach the, the day like it's a game, you uh-huh. know, like in the sense of like an athletic event. Like, you know, have you you've gotten your rest? Have you eaten properly? You know, so you can get through and you can be intense throughout the work day. And I always try to give that advice to people because, you know, that's all we got is your time. Right. And so, you know, build your day around functioning at a high level as possible. I love this, that we would all kind of organize our day like an athlete does. Yeah, you really yeah. think about your performance yeah. through the day yeah. and how food, it's funny, for the longest time I feel like we've had a disconnect about what food does to our bodies yeah. and what food is there to do for us. And I think for a long time we were thinking, oh, it's just, I've, I've got a taste yeah. for something, oh, almost yeah. like an addiction yeah. for something. Yeah. I just want to feed that addiction rather than sustain myself yeah, we've gotten yeah. away from that so i love that that we I love, think like i love athletes. the work that, that is going on between the microbiome and the brain and, and what's yeah. what's the connection between the two and and defining all kinds of solutions to things or at least contributing factors to things like alzheimer's and, right. and others and even even I, I think about kids and and learning struggles they have and you know could you eradicate or address some of that through the food they're eating. I completely agree. Just getting rid of some sugar and putting some protein in its place seems to make a lot of sense. Okay, so we're kind of winding down here. I want to just uh, encourage everyone to go and subscribe because we are on iTunes. We're also on YouTube. Elizabeth Alfano, you can subscribe there. Uh, He's not going to go quite yet. Quick little questionnaire for you. Okay, we're going to run down some quick questions just for you. Super fast. What item will we always find in your fridge? Ah, uh, beyond beyond meat. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Okay, what is your go-to meal? Like you're on the run, you're fast, you don't have a lot right. of time. Something that you put together super fast. Right, I'll have our burger. Oh, yeah, burger. Okay, because right. it cooks up in like six minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah that's what we did here. That's yeah. why we ran a little late because yeah. uh, we were flipping burgers, <laughs> yeah. which is super fun. Yeah. Uh, okay, I love grapefruit. By the way, I eat a lot of, of grapefruit. grapefruit. I'm okay, well, grapefruit. I don't know if that counts as my next question. What's your favorite <laughs> junk food? But if you don't have a junk food, because you maybe don't, knowing you, God. you could give me your favorite Boy, snack. My but... favorite. Uh, you know, there's a new ice cream that I really like. It's uh, not a moo. It's a vegan ice cream. <laughs> Love yeah. that name. Yeah. That's really, really good. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I just had it. In fact, so I was just at the, I was at the creamery in Manhattan Beach, and I returned the ice cream they gave me, and I said, you guys got to talk to this company, so I'm going to connect them with it, because it is so good. So good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll yeah. look for that. Not yeah. a moo. Yeah, not a moo. Yeah. And uh, hopefully they have salted caramel, which is my yeah. gig. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> do you have any pets? And if so, do you think there are any? 
any different than farm animals? Right. <laughs> it's a trick question. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we have a lot of pets. Uh, my kids love animals, and, and, uh, and so we have uh, turtles, we have a tortoise, uh, we have a pig. Uh, pig. What kind yeah, of pig? He's, he's like, he was supposed to be a pot belly. Uh, Everybody he, says that, and then they get them and they're huge. He's yeah. ridiculous. In fact, my shirt is. Oh, it, sort of, is your pig? Well, it's a W on the shoe for Wilbur. <laughs> uh, and I begged my kids not to name him Wilbur because I was like, you know, every pig is named Wilbur. Please don't, but Wilbur is. No. And our cat, we have a cat, we have dogs. So, yeah. How many dogs? <laughs> we have two here. We have a farm back east. We have some dogs too. Oh, it's yeah. so yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Well, but do you think they're any different than farm animals? No, and that's the thing. So, so the, this is one of the key motivating factors that got me into this business was as a kid so I lived in Washington DC I grew up in Washington DC and in College Park Maryland my dad is a professor and that gives him some time on the weekends and stuff to do things and so he loved the country grew up in the country wanted us to have that experience so we bought a farm on the western part of the state of Maryland and it was supposed to be a hobby farm but it became a dairy farm so we had 100 head of Holstein cattle there and so I would be up there on the weekends and during the summer and would just think in my mind about the difference between the two, and they were you know, treated fine, but the difference between the, the cows in the barn and or any animal and, and the ones that were sleeping in my bed as a dog, right? And so, but I didn't understand at the time, but as I grew older and, and particularly read Darwin, uh, and the, the Darwin's emphasis on degrees of difference, so there's no absolute differences where, you know, this animal belongs on this side of the fence and this one on that one based on some genetic difference. His whole point was there's only variations and small degrees of difference, and so... The difference between a, a dog and a pig in terms of genetics and biology and so on, there's no difference that would justify different treatment, right? right. And that, that, I think, is sort of a scientific fact and one that our ethics have yet to catch up with. Yes, I completely agree with that because pigs are even smarter than dogs, as they're we know. Bright. Yeah, they're pretty And bright. they're wonderful pets. They're and so it's, it's really a willful choice to yeah. turn against yeah. them, yeah. as we have. Okay. Um, the next three are a little tough, yeah. uh, but it's, try to answer as quickly as you can in, in the sense that hopefully this answer will come just from your gut. Okay, got it. What do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Um, it's a, it's, so I, I knew this, but I didn't act on it every day is um, uh, something that my friend uh, told me once, which is um, uh, don't live small. Don't live small. So do you mean like go big or go home? Yeah, just in everyday basis. You yes. know, like, like just, just be who you are. Don't, don't live small. I love that. Uh, if you want to be known for one bit of change in the world, what would that be? Well, I want our whole company to be known as the group of people that separated me from animals. Love that. Say it again. would like to, our company to be known as a group of people that, in an evolutionary timeline, separated me from animals. Amen. And this may be a little bit of the same question, but there's enough of a variation that we'll see how you answer do you know what your true purpose is in life? And in, if so, what is it? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was raised Quaker. Uh, and so part of being Quaker is to have a calling. And, and so, you know, first and foremost is about my family and, 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 and being, a, a, you know, the best father I can be, et cetera. But, you know, this is my calling you know, what I'm doing now. Yes, you feel that this is your calling. Well, uh, amen to you for living your calling and for not living small, because we can say that this man is not living small. (laughs) And I'm not small. I want to, and you're not small because he's super tall. How tall are you? Uh, Six five. He's six five. Okay, so he accomplishes it on many levels. Uh, I want to thank you for coming to my house, Ethan Brown, Beyond Meat. Oh, thank you. So very sweet. Thank you for making, oh my gosh, Beyond Meat sausages look how thick, taste just like sausage. And of course, we already know that Beyond Meat burgers, they're everywhere, folks. You got to get them taste like meat and is so much better for you and the environment and for animals thanks for joining us everybody subscribe i appreciate you thanks very much for having me appreciate it bye folks